Hey gang, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, actually just north of Minneapolis in Anoka, and we are at the state hospital here, what was a very chilling place, called it back then a lunatic asylum. And if you're wondering what that is, those are riser locations, portals to the scary tunnels that are below. We're going to talk about it. They are all over the place here. There's a network of tunnel systems that circulate all over the place. They call it the catacombs. And this was a terrible place. A terrible place. And let's take a look at that building there, one of the workhouses or cottages. Now, the Anoka State Hospital here opened in 1900. It's closed down now. I think it operated for about 99 years. When they first opened it, it housed 100 male patients, but they weren't called patients, they were called inmates. And when they came, we're right by the railway, and when they came here and got off the train, there was newspaper reporters and a crowd of some four or five hundred people called in the newspaper the morbidly curious. They turned out to see these feeble-minded people wondering what they would be like. The men came from 30 counties in Minnesota, and they ranged in age from 24 to 78. And only 10 of them were ever discharged from this, this horrible place. At some point, female patients would be added just a few years later, and the population grew, and it grew exponentially. There was only one that was eventually discharged of these female patients. 45 lived here until they died. They were really kept prisoner at this place. And it is all boarded up. Look at that up there. That is spooky. Just imagine what went on behind these walls. Just imagine if you were to be here back then, the faces peering out at you, maybe mouths agape. By the mid-century, this place had over a thousand patients. Higher patient numbers were driven in, partly by the eugenics movement. As I said, the patients were called feeble-minded. It was a term that they used back then. And I'll tell you what, back in those days, look at this, look at the stairs crumbling away. Now back in those days, anybody could commit you to an asylum. Anybody, your family member, they could just call up and say, my uncle's weird. And many times it was for an inheritance. And they put you away and you couldn't get out. Can you imagine? There was no checks and balances back then. Look at that window right there. You just almost can see these. I don't know, I keep going back to that. The faces. Oh, there's a lot of energy here. A lot of a lot of bad stuff.
Now I'm standing at the end of what is a very large open field at the center and these tunnels they they are under this area and they connect to all of these buildings now they say that the patients these insane people would try to escape of course there are no were no walls they would escape to the tunnels and they it's like a maze down there and they would get lost down there and they would kill themselves I mean who wouldn't try to escape they would do lobotomies they would do shock treatments they would do torture I mean you've heard the stories but uh, look and these portals coming up are everywhere Now this is kind of known as one of the most haunted places, if not the most haunted place in all of Minnesota. A lot of paranormal experiences are said to have been reported here. A lot of torture devices, restraints, they say could still be found here. And there are remnants in those tunnels of scratches on the concrete walls. In 1949, there was a bonfire here, right out here. It was the governor. Reports were coming out that there were all of these tortures that were happening here. And they had 359 straitjackets, 196 handcuffs, and 91 straps. They were used on the inmates, as they called them, and they were destroyed by then Governor Luther Youngdahl. It is said that there are many restless spirits here at this place, and they are not happy. And who could blame them? Who could blame them? They were not treated very kind. And we are going to go from here to the cemetery because they were not treated very kind in death either. So let's take a ride down the Rum River and go to the cemetery. We are at the cemetery. We are at the cemetery. 
a very simple gate and a very simple sign. Anoka State Hospital Cemetery, it says. Let's enter. Well, where do we start? Well, I can tell you this, this is all new, newer tombstones, gravestones. And there were some nice people, there are some nice people who have come forward over the years. And they provided these because they were just numbers before. And I'm looking here and you can barely see where the, the stone number was. They were only identified by a number, like Alma here, who passed in 1952. Let's look at a few of these. Sarah Baker passed in 1952, and as I'm looking here, it looks like they go in order. That was, Alma was April, April 29th. Sarah is April 16th. Yes, Newt Moen, April 5th. They were just numbers before. Here you can barely see the concrete cast in place. Ah, oh, there's nothing much. Well, it's buried. Anna Carlson. March 21st, 1952. Born in the late 1800s, most of these people. You can only wonder what were their stories. These are all women. Another 1952, Louise Frieda Vetter, or Yetter, I think that's a Y. Here's a man, Jacob. July 2nd, 1864 is when he was born. Passed away in the winter of 1952. Jacob Klee, and so on. Well, I would like to see if we can find the grave of number one. That's what I'd like to do. Because grave number one was a German immigrant. Couldn't find his name. And it is said that this was in 1900 when they first opened. He walked into the Rum River, Rum River to commit suicide. That's what he, that's what happened to him. We'll see if we can find his grave. Let's just pause here and look around. I don't see numbers. It's very, it's not like I'm going to dig these all up. But it was August 9th, as I recall, in 1900. So it's going to be tough to do it without a name. 1940. So the numbers are going down now. Evelyn Thomas. 400 people here, I, I understand. It's so nice they came back and they... I'm pretty sure everyone now has a stone. So they're not just a number anymore. Anna Myers past December 14th, 1940. Here's some more over here. Okay, it goes all the way to the end. Now we're going up, 1941. Nicholas. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a picture? And I can tell you this, we'll never see a picture for almost all of these people. In name they are remembered, but their stories, their life, their image when they were on this earth is gone forever. They will never be known except to God. 
like Tom Olson, who passed in May 1942. Wow. You know, I go back to 1941. Peter here, Peter Finnerty, no doubt an Irishman. So just think, just a few weeks, two or three weeks later, right? Three weeks later, December 7th, attack on Pearl Harbor. He died literally three weeks before, before that, wow. It's funny how we put things and relate things to famous events. Famous events that we find impactful. We're all different. Now the dates, 1947, 1951, Arthur Drew, Again, born in 1884. Swedish man, Alfred Johnson. It's a beautiful place here if you come. It's actually right next to the high school. Well, we've got to get back to 1900. I've got to believe his grave has to be here somewhere. Let's just keep watching the dates. Okay, 1910. Now, oh, look at this. We're getting into some real numbers here. November 16th for Barbara Stersinger. She's number, she was number, only known as number 71. You know, this was common at the state hospitals. We did an episode near me with the numbers. They still don't have stones. In fact, they had some stones and they were knocked down. Ooh, that just missed me. I'll tell you, they say there's a lot of paranormal activity here. We're not a paranormal channel but I may have to come back with IQ. Intangible Quests, that's our paranormal channel. You can find the link in the description box. Uh, number 103. So the numbers are kind of going up and down here. 118, Anna, passed in 1914. 126. And the next one, 137, 143. Let's go this way. Okay, the numbers are coming down. The numbers are coming down. We are at 108. Look how deeply that is stamped in. Look how, they, how crude that was. was for Amanda, Amanda Coombs, who passed March 9th, 1913. Now we're getting, now we're getting somewhere. It's 97, 123. Now the numbers are kind of jumping around here. 131. We're not going. We're not going down. We're on a, a wild goose chase here. Well, many times the first graves are at the top of the high ground. Why did they use land like this? Most cemeteries are on land where. You know, the top of a hill, many times a steep hill. Some people say flooding, some people say other reasons, but I've come to find out the real reason for this. You noticed this or found this out in New England, 
is it's really unusable farmland. It was unusable farmland. Farmland was everything back in the 1800s. And if it was unusable, that's the main reason. And many times those views, they had the views. It'd be a beautiful outlook from up high, but with the steep hills. Now, the numbers are going way down. Here's number 34. Gus Johnson. Do you know what? Gus Johnson, I believe, is the name. Oh no, it's Gus Carlson. Famous baseball player. Covered his grave. Gus Johnson died July 7th, 1907. And he was known as 34. Oh, it's brutal. Brutal, guys. William Towers is 26, he was. Passed in 1906. We're getting close. It's got to be up. Well, it's got to be up here. Let's take a look. Number eight. Frank Barsh. Born in 1850. Now, what's interesting is a lot of these people here died pretty young, 1849. I'm not saying young, but, you know, in their 50s. I guess that was old age back then. Every single one of them, look at this. 64. Well, almost all of them. Here's number two. Jacob Johnson. We've got 19, oh, I see number one. Okay, let's just take a quick look here first. Jacob Johnson, November 8th, 1900, known as number two, second man. So here it is. So his name, this is number one. So his name was William Pizal. And there is the date that I was referencing of August 9th, 1900. Known then as number one. He committed suicide, William did, walking into the Rum River. You can only wonder what this poor man went through. What a sad story. But we'll end on a positive note because People, generous people, thoughtful people from the area or maybe the state have come here and cleaned off those numbers and provided gravestones for them. And a nice place, a nice place to be remembered. Well, may all here rest in peace. Rest in peace.
Thank mm-hmm. you.